This will be the overview for 1 Peter. Now, 1 Peter has five chapters, 105 verses, and around 2,482 words. The time period is around 60 AD. The theme is suffering. The author, obviously, Simon Peter. Now, our three applications. What's the historical application? That is that Peter wrote to believers who had been scattered through persecution. The doctrinal application is, this is a letter to suffering tribulation saints in and around Babylon. It says in 1 Peter 5.13, The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Now the inspirational. This can be your New Testament suffering manual. You can go to this and get all types of good stuff about suffering, how to deal with suffering, why you suffer, things like that. Chapter 1. In chapter 1, you got the trial of your faith. 1 Peter 1-2. Let's just start looking at some verses in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1-2. It says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. You see, you aren't elect because God chose you against your will. You are elect because you chose to get in Christ yourself. And God sees through His foreknowledge who's going to choose to get in Christ. It's not that He's choosing who gets in Christ. He just already knows who's going to get in Christ, and you have a free will to either get in Christ or reject Christ. Ephesians 1 4 says, According as he hath chosen us in him. Notice that key phrase, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God chose to save anyone who choose, chooses of their own free will to get in him. He didn't choose who would be saved and lost. 1 Peter 1, three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Begotten us again. That phrase. Well, that's born again. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3.3-7. 3, 3 through 7, He said, You must be born again. You see, when you get saved, it wasn't just a feeling or an experience or a conversation with God. Something actually took place. A spiritual birth took place. When you were begotten again, you didn't go back into your mother's womb and be born again physically. You were born again spiritually and you became a son of God, a new creature. And this proves that you can't lose your salvation. An actual birth took place, a spiritual birth. I mean, you can't go back and undo your, your physical birth. So you can't go back and undo your spiritual birth. A birth took place. And if you realize that, you'll realize that nothing can change the fact that you're born again. You can't be unborn again. I was listening to a holiness preacher one time. I went to a holiness church for a while. And he just kept saying, if you... Uh, continue in sin, you're going to have to get reborn again. That makes no sense. You see, for every person that gets saved, they've made a reservation on the other side, and this inheritance doesn't fade away. In 1 Peter 1, four, it says, "...to inherit inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you." It's reserved in heaven for you. It doesn't fade away. And in Matthew six nineteen through 21, it talks about treasures that will fade away. It says, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You see, the things you get when you get saved are permanent. The inheritance is incorruptible. It says in 1 Corinthians 15.53, For this corruptible, that's your 
you, your, your vile body, must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. You're going to get a new body, a body that will never die, a body that will never corrupt, a body that's immortal. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, it says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So here is your trial of your faith. When you get saved, you're going to go through some things. You'll be tried with fire. And when you're tried... You want to come forth as gold. Just like Job said in Job 23.10. He said, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You see, you want to go through these temptations and suffering down here with the right mindset, the right attitude, and never accusing God and and uh, going against God. And you're, you're going to come out like gold if you do that. When you get saved, you begin building a building to present to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation, and you're building on top of that foundation. It says in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 12, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, you see that? Are you building with Gold, silver, and precious stones or wood, hay, and stubble? How are you uh, taking this trial of your faith? Uh, What are you building with? When your faith is tried by the fire, are you staying faithful? Are you continuing in the fight? And when you get up to the judgment seat of Christ and He puts your building through that fire, is it going to be able to withstand that fire or is it just going to burn up? It says in 1 Peter 1, eight, Whom having not seen, ye love. And whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Even though you haven't seen Jesus Christ, you still love him. Uh, 1 John 4.19, we love him because he first loved us. And Peter says, um, he'll cause you to jo- rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Uh, no wonder uh, Paul... The Apostle Paul could be happy going through infirmities. And uh, he said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, and reproaches, and necessities, and persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak... Then am I strong? You see, he's going to come through that trial. That trial of fire, he's coming through it like gold. And I'd say Paul is going to rack up at the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Peter 1, 9 through 10. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Notice that it says, prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, but it wasn't like the grace that you have. Uh, The prophets didn't have it like you have it. They prophesied of the grace that should come. 1 Peter 1.11 Searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. You see, the prophets wrote about the sufferings of Christ back there in Isaiah 53, for example, and they wrote about the glory that should follow. But they didn't understand what they were writing. The disciples themselves didn't understand the gospel. Uh, They were looking for the Messiah to take the kingdom As soon as he stepped on the scene, they didn't understand he had to be crucified first. They weren't looking for a cross. They were looking for a crown. They weren't looking forward to the cross. They were looking forward to a kingdom. It says in 1 Peter 1.12, Unto whom it was revealed, 
that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Now notice it said, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves. You see, they didn't have light on it yet, like me and you got it. They weren't looking forward to the cross. They didn't have light on that. They were waiting for a kingdom. They didn't realize the cross was coming before there would be a crown. The disciples didn't even understand it. Uh, why do you think Peter cut off Malchus's ear? You know, why do you think that they didn't, uh, they had a hard time believing at first that the Lord had been resurrected? Why do you think that when uh, Jesus preached the death, burial, and resurrection to the disciples, they didn't understand it? It said it was, this, this saying was hid from them. It says in uh, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Okay, redeem means to buy back. And there isn't enough money or corruptible things on this planet to pay for your soul. It had to be God's blood that paid for your soul. And it says in Acts twenty twenty eight that He purchased us with His own blood. And that's what redeems you. It says in 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again. There's that born again again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You see, someone preached the word to you, read it to you, or you read it, or heard it, or sent it on a billboard, or in some way, God got the word to you, and it got planted in you, and it sprouted up. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You placed your faith on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and you were born again. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. First Peter one twenty four. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. When you see these people that focus so much on their body and how they look and what they dress their body up with and all that, they may not realize it, but all flesh is as grass. They're nothing. They're just going to wither up and die one day. It don't matter how much cream you put on your face, one day you're going to wake up and it's just going to be full of wrinkles. And there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, the devil wants you to be ashamed of your wrinkles and your gray hair. And, but if you've used your years wisely in the right way, then those wrinkles and gray hair just show you've been through some things. You've learned some things and you've, you've got some wisdom about you. That's what that stuff ought to show. But the devil's made the world think that being old and having wrinkles and gray hair and being old is such an undesirable thing and that old people are just old fogey and they don't know anything and they're not cool and they need to do everything to stop themselves from getting old and looking old. That's what the devil wants you to think. But getting old is like reaching the finish line if you're saved. I mean, I think it's amazing somebody could live 80 years and not die. It's hard for me to imagine living until I'm 80, you know, without dying, without getting hit by a truck, ran off the road, shot in a drive-by, falling off a cliff or something. You know, I just I have a hard time imagining I could make it that long and not die. But to reach 80, you see, I'm almost going to have to live what I've already lived almost two more times. You know, that's a long way off for me. And my mind can't imagine that. But you think about it like this. It will be e easy to imagine that when you get 80. Because when you get 80, you're going to look back and say, Wow, that was fast. Where did all the years go? Time went by so quickly. You see, when, when you're much younger than 80, you think, Wow, I'll never live that long. Just like when you were six years old, you didn't think, Well, you... you well, I'll be 30 before you know it. No, you thought 30 years old is a long time away. 
but it's not actually a long time away. If I make it to 80, I'll be able to look back and see how fast it all went. But all flesh is as grass, and you're going to die if the rapture doesn't happen soon. You're going to die. All flesh is as grass. Your flesh will die, but look at verse 25. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The word of God won't die, and you won't die, because you were born again by the incorruptible seed of the word. Uh, The person who gave you salvation will never die. So you will never die. Now chapter 2. This chapter is about how we're a peculiar people of an holy nation, so we need to suffer for Christ. Remember the theme of 1 Peter is suffering. In 1 Peter 2.2 it says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. You know, I just talked about how you are born again, spiritually speaking. And when you get born again, you are a newborn babe in the Lord. And you should be desiring the sincere milk of the Word. I've had two kids, and they can't feed themselves the milk at first. I had to put the bottle in their mouth. They they needed me to put the bottle in their mouth. And if you're a new believer, or possibly an old believer that is still a babe because you never grew... You need a trustworthy person to put the bottle in your mouth to feed you the Word of God. And this is how you will grow. Get the sincere milk of the Word so that you can grow thereby. 1 Peter 2, nine. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. You see, I live geographically in America, but I'm really a part of a holy nation, and that's not America. America is not a holy nation. I'm really a citizen of heaven. Ephesians 2, 6 says, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You see, Jesus Christ is in heaven at the right hand of the Father. I'm in Him, so I'm up there too. I never really did get on the Trump train. And I don't have any hope placed in Republicans or Democrats or Independents. Obviously, I'm not going along with Democrats. That's just crazy. It would be crazy to do. But I never got on the Trump train either. There's just no hope in that stuff. You see, I may live in America physically for now. But this isn't my home. I really live in heaven. I'm a member of a holy nation. I'm a citizen up there. And what you get with this stuff down here, the politics down here, all you're doing is picking between the lesser of two evils. Uh, Both, uh, no matter where you go, they got no morals. Almost no morals. It always was crazy to me how some Christians would get more mad about what you say about Donald Trump they would get more mad about that than they would someone blaspheming Jesus Christ. It made no sense to me. Uh, I've seen people who were taking sides with Trump over a Bible-believing pastor. Like if a Bible-believing pastor said something negative about Trump or critical, they would take Trump's side over that pastor, over the Bible-believing pastor. It, It makes no sense to me. Uh, But there won't be any peace until the real king shows up. I'm not putting any... I'm not putting much into these politicians down here. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is the king of a holy nation. And right now, his kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, then his servants would fight. But he's not bringing in the kingdom until Revelation 19, and then we're going to fight. Uh, I was listening to a guy one time in person, and he said that if you don't vote, then you're in sin. I thought, that's crazy. Where's that at in the Bible? How can you say that it's a sin not to vote? 
when all you're doing is voting between the lesser of two evils. That's all you're doing. None of them's going to help out. I mean, obviously, I would rather have Trump over the alternative. But <clears throat> that's not. there's no hope in it. Right now, uh, we don't war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And I'm not talking about being a conscientious objector. I know sometimes there has to be wars. I know sometimes you have to defend yourself with physical weapons. But when it comes to our spiritual battles and converting people to Jesus Christ, we use the Word of God, the spiritual sword. And we are a part of a holy nation. We're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. And it says in 1 Peter 2, 10 through 11, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which hath, had, hath not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. See, in this world, I'm a stranger and I'm a pilgrim. I'm just passing through. And on the way through, I'm going to have worldly stuff bombarding me. I have to abstain from the fleshly lusts. That's my war. That's my battle I got going on. Notice that word, that phrase, they war against the soul. How do I go to war with fleshly lusts? With my spiritual sword. You see, every saint is a soldier in the Lord's army. And it says that he chose us to be a soldier in 2 Timothy 2.4. And it says in 1 Peter 2.12, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. It says they speak against you as evildoers. That is evildoers acting like you're the evildoer, which doesn't make sense. But Isaiah 5.20 says they call evil good, and they call good evil, Right? It is very childish. Think about it. You know, when you discipline your child, what do they think a lot of times? They think, you're being mean. And even say, you're being mean. They say, you spanked me. You're mean. You're rude. You know how they do. Uh, but no, that's wrong. You're not being mean. They're being mean, and you're trying to keep them from being mean when you spank them. See, when you discipline your child, it's because you love them, and you're being nice to them by doing so, by not letting them get away with their bad things that they're doing, right? The world does the same thing. They see the saint object to stuff and say that it's wrong and evil and a sin and uh, that we should put a stop to it. And they say, well, those Christians are mean, old, hateful bigots. That's thinking like a child. You're calling evil good and good evil. Don't you know there are things out there that are not good for you? Are you thinking like you did when you were a child? When they persecute you for righteousness sake, which they're going to do because they think good is evil, they're going to persecute you for righteousness sake. You need to be like Jesus if in 1 Peter 2.22. It says, Who did no sin, neither was gall found in his mouth. You can't be sinless like him, but you can try. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should not live should live under righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. He bear our sins on the cross. He carried the cross for us. So we need to carry the cross through this world and represent a holy nation. We need to be ambassadors. For our holy nation, we need to be more focused on it, setting our affection on things above, not on things on the earth, putting a lot less hope in the politics and stuff on this world, and have all our, our hope in a sure thing, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed hope. Now, chapter 3, it's about suffering for well-doing and the husband and wife relationship. It says in 1 Peter 3, 1, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. If you have an unbelieving husband who doesn't treat you very well, 
Divorce isn't the answer. Uh, being a godly wife is the best way to turn them to the Lord. You can win them over by your conversation. And this isn't just how you talk. It's how you live in front of Him. It says, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. You see, you need to be chaste. You need to clean up your mouth, clean up what you're watching on TV, be honest, be faithful. Don't sit around talking about how good looking you think the male actors are on TV and posting all over Facebook how gorgeous the uh, actors and stuff are that you see on TV. All this... Stuff shows inconsistency. You're not showing a chaste conversation when you do that to your husband. He's looking for every, your husband's looking for every excuse in the world to believe that you don't live up to what you profess to believe about God and the Bible. And he is going to see that and notice it. He's going to see you uh, doing that. It's just going to make him amp up himself that's probably already doing that you know every time he sees a woman he thinks looks good he comments on it and has lustful thoughts about her and so if he sees you doing that about the men that you see on tv and posting it on facebook for everybody to see uh, it's probably going to make it worse for you you know little things like that doing just just running your mouth all the time, nagging, yelling. That's not helping you out. It says in 1 Peter 3.3, 3, Who's adorning? Talking about the woman, the wife. Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. It doesn't say that you can't wear gold or jewelry. It says to not let that be your adorning. You know, don't let... Don't let what's beautiful about you only be what he sees on the outside. But rather, verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. You see, the hidden man in your heart is Jesus Christ if you're saved. And he needs the, the husband that's lost and acting horribly, and being a horrible husband, needs to see Jesus Christ in you. He doesn't need a loudmouth wife who nags and complains and whines and makes fun of him and puts him down and tells him about how bad he is all the time. You need a meek and quiet spirit, or you'll never win him over. It says in Proverbs 21, 9, It is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a white house. Proverbs 7, uh, 27, 15, A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. You know, uh, you're going to help yourself a lot better if you have a meek and quiet spirit. 1 Peter 3, 5, For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Now notice the attribute of a holy woman was being in subjection to her own husband. And today a lot of women have no respect for their husband. But they go to work and do everything their boss says, right? Somebody else's husband but yet they can't be in subjection to their own husband. So that's why it says be in subjection to their own husbands, because that's the hard part for the wife. It says, Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. See, to a lot of women, this verse is just brutal. I mean, Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You call your husband moron, doofus, idiot, douchebag, whatever you call him. You call him some horrible names. Um, and the devil comes in your mind and says, you're just a little homekeeping slave or something like that. But that's not true. Uh, start trying to take care of your husband and watch your marriage turn around. Stop the nagging. Stop trying to change him. Stop trying to run the show. 
and just know your role. And that's going to help you a lot more than constantly opening your mouth about everything. Most likely, he's doing an even worse job of doing his role as a husband than you are as a wife. Because men, obviously, men are sorry, low down, and selfish. But you're not doing your responsibilities as a wife. You know, you, if you're not doing the responsibilities as a wife that you need to do, it's not going to make up for him neglecting his responsibilities that he should be doing as a husband. You see, two wrongs won't make the marriage better. And a lot of times a spouse vibes off the other spouse. If one of them does right, then maybe it, maybe it will c- encourage the other one to do what's right. If they see the other spouse trying, then maybe they'll start trying. It says in 1 Peter 3, 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. See, if the husband is honoring the wife and taking care of her because she's the weaker vessel, then there's not going to be problems with the wife being in subjection. If a man isn't treating his wife right, then it can hinder his prayers and make it much harder for her to be in subjection. But if the woman is in subjection and he's doing what he ought to do, then it makes both of their jobs much easier. Even if your wife stays at home and you work, Nothing says you couldn't come home and help finish up the housework and help with the kids. That way you can have everything done at a decent time and get the kids in bed early and spend some time together. You know, you treat her as the weaker vessel. She's weaker than you. She can't keep going as long as you. And 1 Peter 3.14, But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. You see, if you're suffering because you're trying your best to live for God, then this verse says you should be happy about it. And that reminds me of Acts 5.41, where it says, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They rejoiced that they were suffering shame for the name of Jesus. So, If you are suffering for righteousness sake, happy are ye. Take pleasure in infirmities that come about in this life. Peter says, be not afraid of their terror. And that hits hard today because what do you see a lot of? Terrorists. And I bet you if Paul or Peter was alive and in a room with these terrorists or Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees or Freddy Krueger, they probably wouldn't be afraid of their terror. It says in 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Be ready always to give an answer. You see, you see lost people everywhere you go. And when, when they see that you're a Christian and you're reading the Bible, they're going to have some questions. You need to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, Rightly dividing the word of the truth. If you're going to be able to answer their questions, then you're going to have to study. Be ready to give an answer. It says in First Peter 3.16, Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. You see, if you're living right and doing what you're supposed to do, You can have a clear conscience. Even when they speak evil of you. They spoke evil of the Lord. They accused Him of things. When you're working for the Lord, they're going to be talking bad about you and falsely accusing you. They want to ruin your reputation. It says in 1 Peter 3.17, For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. You see, people who live wicked end up suffering, and people who live right end up suffering. Make sure the suffering you're doing is for doing right. And then you can rejoice in it. It says in 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. You see, all the suffering Jesus did was for doing right. 
And when he was put to death in the flesh, he suffered for all of our doing wrong. He took our sins and suffered for them. And then he, he, he died on the cross and he was buried and he was in the heart of the earth. And when he did that, when he was in the heart of the earth, in verse 19 and 20, it says, By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. He went down there and he preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, were in few that his eight souls were saved by water. The spirits in prison are those angels which kept not their first estate. Angels are spirits and not souls. And when Jesus Christ was in the heart of the earth, he went down there and preached to those spirits in prison. prison. And notice he put those spirits right in the context of the days of Noah. And that has to do when the sons of God came down and cohabitated with the human women. Genesis 6, 4. And Peter also said, eight souls were saved by water. And this is a big uh, Church of Christ verse. And they want to use this to say you're saved by getting water baptized. But this doesn't mean the water saved Noah. Uh, the water never touched Noah. They were in the ark. I mean, this is something completely different. And it says, The like figure were unto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Water baptism is just the answer of a good conscience toward God. It doesn't save anybody. Chapter 4. In this chapter, it talks about suffering by putting down the flesh. 1 Peter 4 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. See, Jesus left heaven. He came down, suffered all the suffering any human does, suffered through temptations and pain and hunger and thirst and the death of the cross. And when you put down the flesh and turn down sin, you're suffering. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. When you go long periods of time with no sin, and I mean, could be an hour, you probably did a lot of suffering not to commit that certain sin. When you put down the flesh and turn down sin, you're suffering. And your flesh wants to do the thing that it's not supposed to do. It says in 1 Peter 4.2 that he should no longer, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. You see, it's not the will of God for you to do all these fleshly lusts all the time that you're, you want to do in the flesh. You see, when you were lost, all you thought about was pleasing the flesh, and you always just gave in to what the flesh wanted, and that's all you cared about. It says in verse 3, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. You see, you walked in the flesh. And even now you can walk in the flesh if you don't, let the Spirit lead you by through the words of God. 1 Peter 4, four. Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you. Once again, suffering for righteousness sake. If you don't run and do the same things they did, what are they going to say? They're going to speak evil of you. They're going to call good evil. You see, when you change your lifestyle and quit walking in the flesh... Your friends are going to think you're strange. The people you meet are going to think you're a weirdo for not drinking. They're going to think you're crazy for not smoking, for not partying, and listening to filthy music. I've had people say to me plenty of times, they say, you don't smoke, that you don't drink. What do you do? You know, they think the only fun that there is has to be illegal or immoral. They don't think that there's any good, clean fun. And I've been called plenty of names for not going along with the crowd. But in a small form, I'm suffering for righteousness' sake. It says in Exodus 23, 2, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. You don't have to do evil things, immoral things, illegal things, just because everybody else is doing it. 
It says in 1 Peter 4.15, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. You will suffer for evil doing. A murderer gets a life sentence or the death penalty. If he doesn't get caught, then he'll suffer carrying the guilt of killing somebody. If he doesn't get caught or carry the guilt, he will be paranoid that he's going to get caught the rest of his life. You see, you're going to suffer for your sin, whether it be a murder or being a thief or any kind of evildoer or a busybody. A busybody in other men's matters will have to suffer the drama and stress of not minding their own business. Uh, the more you stick your nose in other people's business, the more stress you're going to have. It says in 1 Peter 4.16, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Suffering is good as long as you're suffering for the right things. And if you're suffering as a spouse that's married to an unsafe spouse, and you're living right, and you're doing what you ought to do, you're suffering for righteousness' sake. Chapter 5. Chapter 5 sh sh uh, shows us a great thing about suffering. And that is, suffering is only for a while. That's what you see in chapter 5. It says in 1 Peter 5.10, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while. That shows you it don't last forever. He says, Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. It said, uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The suffering down here is only a while. It's a light affliction according to Paul. And that's how you know it's not hell. You're not going through hell on earth because hell isn't just for a while and it's not a light affliction. But if you're a Christian, then this is as close to hell as you're going to get to. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 2 says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who also am an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. He says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. You see, you need to be feeding the flock. Get into the Bible and prepare a meal to feed other Christians. Uh, the pastor needs to be doing this and not doing it for filthy lucre. That means he shouldn't be in it for the money. It says, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And a lot of pastors today aren't much of an in sample. They are a sample of God showing you how not to do it many times. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. You see, if, if you did feed the flock with the right motive, with the right heart attitude, you're going to get a crown when Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd, shows up. This crown won't fade away. People down here are looking for a corruptible crown. They are working to be put in history books that will only fade away in the end. It says in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil... As a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. See, right after telling the chief, sh chief shepherd to feed the flock, he talks about the roaring lion. And if you're in charge of feeding other Christians the word, then you better stay sharpening your weapon. You better be exercising yourself unto godliness because you don't want to be out of fighting shape when you get in a spiritual battle. It says, Whom resists steadfast in the face? Talking about the adversary. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. See, don't get too discouraged if you're going through suffering for righteousness sake. Because the same afflictions are going on in the life of many Christians around the world. You just don't know it. You just don't know about other Christians. You just don't know them. There are great Bible-believing pastors that don't even know each other exist in America. Even in a time when we got YouTube and Facebook and all this social media stuff, everybody puts their stuff on there, they don't even know each other exist. Elijah didn't know that there were 7,000 other men out there that hadn't bowed the knee to the image of Baal. He had no idea. I like to get Bible believers together. 
And I think it's encouraging to know that there's other people out there going through the same things that believe just like you believe. There are a lot of Bible believers who don't even know about each other. They don't know the afflictions that each other are going through. And sometimes you'll start thinking you're the only one left until you look around or meet somebody who's like-minded concerning the Scriptures. You see, my pastor, Donnie Dalton, is a Bible believer. He had no idea who Pastor Denny Castle was. So I kind of introduced them to each other. I told, uh, I told Danny to go hear my pastor at this church when he preached in North Carolina. They became friends. Uh, I've, inter- I've introduced my pastor to a lot of other uh, preachers by giving him their, their sermons. And I did the same with Danny. Give him the sermons of other Bible-believing pastors. That way you realize, hey, there's all kinds of other Bible believers out there just like me who believe the Bible just like me. One of the greatest uh, Bible-believing teachers I ever heard is really unknown. Nobody knows who Bob Alexander is. You go out and ask your pastor, you ever heard of Bob Alexander? He's going to be like, I have no idea who that is. You should look him up. He's probably, if not the greatest, one of the greatest Bible minds on the planet right now. You should look him up. Look up Bevins Welder. Look up men like David Hoffman, Kyle Stevens. There's all kinds of good Bible believers out there that nobody even knows exist. But they know about all these other pastors that's not really giving them much. Not really feeding the flock of God, as we just talked about. But it says, the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So you're not going through the suffering by yourself, and the suffering is only for a while. So First Peter is about suffering. If you're going through suffering, read First Peter. It can be your suffering manual. It's good to read it when you're going through suffering. And this was just a quick overview to show you some things about it.